What I believe is going to be most exciting for people who play Destiny is the social experience of colliding with other people in this big world. It's not something that happens in most action games. Why is the right place always so terrifying? I have a confession to make. There was a point where I really wanted to hate Destiny. I watched the entire saga unfurl from the trademark rumors to the Activision announcement to the Destiny beta last summer, but if I hadn't put the game on a shortlist for the show, I would have probably skipped it entirely as it kept sliding down my schedule. Watch Dogs took longer to review than I'd planned and Destiny got moved behind Forza Horizon 2 which hit its own production hurdles as I finished my training to run my first marathon. But another malicious factor was that Destiny was sucking up all my friends' free time. My waking hours were filled with the sound of aliens choking on gunfire and half-heard Xbox Live chatter. These hours of Destiny became days, then weeks, and finally months. Before long, I'd hear stories of torrid endgames in which my friends described the most arbitrary conditions required to obtain the rarest of celebrity items. To think all this was happening against a critically mixed reception across the internet was baffling, but they continued to sink more and more hours into Destiny. The questions kept growing, but atop them all, gleaming like a northern star since the very beginning, was the most pertinent. What the hell is Destiny? After Halo caught on with my college pals, I dreamt that the ultra-talented Bungie had a million kinds of games they wanted to make, so I naively believed that they would pivot to something new for their second Xbox release and let another studio handle Halo. Soon rumors surfaced that they were working on a medieval game called Phoenix, which was later described to be a kind of Castle Siege title. This would have been a great segue, but nope! Halo 2. It made sense, though. Microsoft had zero console franchises at that point, and Bungie was licking their lips at the opportunity to do a proper Halo game without the pressure of being an Xbox launch title. Halo 2 sold like gangbusters and Bungie declared independence from Microsoft afterward, but their contractual obligations to Halo would still take years to fulfill. Halo 3 followed, as did Sidequel ODST, but the prequel Halo Reach would be their last song for Microsoft, who in turn would still have first rights to publish whatever Bungie came up with next. Maybe I'm dressing the situation wrong, but if I were making Halo games for 12 years, then this goes for any franchise, really. I'd probably get really sick of it. Then again, Halo fatigue set in for me about a decade ago anyway. By the end of the aughts, Bungie's next big project bubbled to the surface, codenamed Destiny, and helmed by Bungie's reclusive co-founder, Jason Jones, who disappeared from the limelight after Halo 2. In their 20th anniversary Vidoc, we get our first glimpse of mountains being generated in an editor, the obligatory motion capture session, and a windmill. Oh my god. Destiny was going to be a brand new thing. A sea change. Bungie was going to finally create something so starkly different and exciting, potentially revolutionary, in an entirely new way of thinking that makes the world think twice about- Nope! It's sci-fi soldiers with sci-fi guns shooting aliens in spaceships. Great. Fantastic. Maybe Bungie really did enjoy making all those Halo games, and in some alternate universe, Destiny became reality many years earlier as a Halo game. This is purely conjecture, but it seems that a game with Destiny's scope and complexity would have probably rocked the Halo formula a bit too hard at a time when Microsoft needed a reliable blockbuster franchise. More pressing though, Bungie didn't own the Halo property anymore. They traded it to Microsoft for their independence. If Destiny's formula had become big as a Halo title, they would have been tethered to Microsoft for significantly longer, potentially forever. But it seems Microsoft wasn't interested in Destiny anyway. Having these two similar games in their portfolio would have been really confusing, which is probably what befell Project Gotham Racing after Microsoft built Forza Motorsport in-house. Microsoft was willing to let Bungie go make some other publisher really, really happy. And so they did! Half a year before Halo Reach shipped to retail, Bungie and Activision announced a 10-year partnership to make a quartet of these new Destiny games, a deal worth at least half a billion dollars. For Activision, this was a huge win after one of their main revenue streams, Guitar Hero, fell off the face of the planet along with the rest of the rhythm action genre. Another huge winner was Sony. 
There was something either incredibly exciting or oddly unnerving about the guys behind the Xbox's most popular game showing up at the PlayStation 4 reveal with a game that looked a lot like Halo, with exclusive content and marketing for Sony's console. So, what the hell is Destiny? There are many games, conventions, and genres that you can tag Destiny with, and I'll be doing plenty of that, but the only accurate way to describe Destiny is not that it's an MMO or loot game scaled down, but a Halo game scaled up. It takes all of that series' core concepts, then makes them bigger and persistent as you travel between exquisitely crafted worlds. Of course, this way of thinking sets the stage for Destiny's biggest payoffs and harshest penalties. Our first step, however, is to understand that Destiny is the best shooter that Bungie has ever made. With Destiny, Bungie tweaks the formula for first-person shooters on consoles that they got just right 13 years ago. Halo's recharging health permeated through the genre, but its combat system was an incredibly fresh balance between melee, guns, and grenades, an ideal trinity for an endless number of scenarios. Destiny takes this balance a step further by integrating left trigger scoping from the faster paced Medal of Honor slash Call of Duty games, and that alone makes Halo feel, well, old and kludgy. You see, I was never the biggest fan of Halo's gunplay. I mean, it worked really well, but I despised using any of the disposable alien weaponry, which they foisted on you regularly. They never felt as precise or effective as the human weapons, and came across as more gimmicky, like the Needler's homing projectiles versus the UNSC's traditional gunpowder. On top of that, Halo's foes were often bullet sponges, requiring a special dance and reload as you battled, necessitating a strong melee. I'm sure there's a game design lecture about how the lack of scoping in most of Halo's weapons forced players into tighter confrontations with larger groups of enemies than other games of the era. Halo saved its long-range combat for canned situations where sniper rifles and vehicles were available. Making long-range combat available in Destiny from the get-go is integral to the new game's experience. Since you're no longer shooting from the hip as often and the enemies are more susceptible to your damage, you're able to pop off critical shots quickly and more often than ever in a bungee game. As a warlock, having a melee superpower that vaporized enemies made losing ground much more manageable. The second big wriggle comes with the superpowers, which encircle the combat trinity. Terminating enemies fills your superbar, which allows you to unleash your ultimate class-defining ability, whether devastating super grenades, area of effect buffs for you and your fire team, or defensive shields. But don't think this makes the game's three classes a complementary jigsaw until you reach the absolute depths of the game's content. Each class features two talent trees, each taking about 15 hours to master and another 15 to fill out completely, but the second tree doesn't unlock until you've reached level 15 anyway. Tweaking these talent trees will feel more like Call of Duty kit management than the long haul specking that makes the alternate characters in a full scale role playing game like Skyrim or World of Warcraft satisfying. Handling Destiny's gun inventory is really smart. The game's three weapon slots don't fill up with whatever happens to be lying around like the Halo games, you'll be making some investments. Your primary slot is your workhorse, and you can hold a variety of semi-auto, burst fire, and automatic rifles along with hand cannons. You'll get less ammo for your secondary special weapons, which include shotguns, sniper rifles, and devastating fusion rifles but they're cleverly balanced against how often you'll really need them. You'll receive even less ammo for your rocket launchers and machine guns, which serve as the game's heavy weapons. But you'll only find these pertinent when dousing spongy bosses with gunfire or managing crowds. Eventually, you'll need to pay attention to the various forms of elemental damage your weapons produce because it's no fun coming to a weekly challenge with opponents sensitive to arc damage without guns or powers that deal arc damage. Your guns and armor have their own talent trees that gain experience as you use them. This spares you the usual loot game conceit of tossing out a favorite weapon or chest piece as soon as something newer with a slightly higher number shows up. If I pick up a new scout rifle that can be eventually upgraded to do more damage than my current rifle, but does less damage now, I'm gonna stick to the one I'm invested in. Bungie wants you to feel attached to your weaponry, but they miss something big here. You can't take your starter level 1 rifle and upgrade it through to the end game, even if they balanced it by making modular upgrades extremely expensive. I would grind to keep my old weaponry relevant. Instead, Destiny funnels you into a special list of legendary end game equipment with 
bizarre bungee names. In the end, it doesn't matter how much you loved your upgraded scout rifle, there's an exotic scout rifle at the end of the road that's going to replace it. This isn't unique to Destiny, but Bungie went in this direction and settled for a half measure. It is weird, however, to equip a helmet that increases how far you can throw grenades. Destiny is better playing, better stocked, and far more exciting to shoot in than any Halo game. It pulls off gunplay with such elegance and such fun that it keeps the show going when so much of the game works so very hard against you. You can absolutely hate Destiny as a loot game, but man is it ever so fun to shoot an alien, then dispatch a group with a well-placed grenade before punching an enemy so hard they explode. There are also quite a few aliens in this game, and many bear passing resemblance to Halo Sleeping Grunts or Agile Elites. Bungie brings life to its enemies with excellent animation and intelligence. They chit-chat and flank with ease. They don't give quite the same care to the game's many bosses, who are usually scaled up in slightly modified versions of lesser ranks. Of course, what better way to celebrate Destiny's combat than with the Crucible multiplayer mode, which, briefly, is an awful piece of shit, and I hate it. Crucible unlocks at level 5, which is long before you understand the nuances of Destiny's combats or have upgraded your abilities. You'll be getting sniped, slashed, and bombed by high-end players over and over and over again. It doesn't even matter that all of your weaponry is balanced against other players when they're blowing you up with the game's best grenades and supers. Not every multiplayer game needs to be a twitchy run and gunner, but porting your single player mechanics to a boiled down competitive format just isn't good enough. Crucible really feels like a tacked on experience to appease those who were looking for a Halo style multiplayer. It might be that I also suck at this kind of stuff, but even as you level up and learn the game, between deathmatch, team deathmatch, and point capture modes, there's actually not much variety here anyway. Oh, speaking of which... It doesn't take long playing Destiny before several parallel versions of Deja Vu set in. Destiny is a game of two parts, the first 19 levels before you reach 20, then the march to level 30 and beyond. If you had a spectrum in which action shooter Halo is on one side, and a nominal MMO like World of Warcraft is on the other, you'd put loot games like Borderlands and Diablo in the center. The first 19 levels, which we'll call the campaign, exist in the first valley, where Destiny feels like an upconverted Halo. The latter levels, which we'll call the end game, lie in the second valley and possibly beyond, and we'll talk about those later. I already mentioned how the terrific combat winds up being the driving force to play, but somewhere along the way to making a really big Halo game, something got lost in the mix. Before I get too deep into this, Jason Jones talked with IGN about, among other things, his biggest issue with the original Halo's level design, which illuminates a lot about Destiny's level design. Quote, I think the great tragedy of Halo is that for years and years, it provided wonderful single-player and co-op content, and we provided people with almost no fun incentives or excuses, almost no reason besides their own enjoyment, to go back and replay it. So Halo 1 built these 10 labor of love missions, and only if you decided to go back and replay them was there any incentive to do so." End quote. Destiny takes place across four worlds, Earth, the Moon, Venus and Mars, gated by progression. Linking these is the tower, based at the edge of mankind's last city, which serves as your town, or starting point. Each planet features a short roster of story and side missions, at least one strike, and a free roam mode called Patrol, which we'll get into first. These environments are dressed in lavish detail. The backgrounds feature the most magnificent and dynamic skyboxes you've ever seen, with 3D detail filling to the horizon. You'll be tempted to explore what's out there, but the game isn't very explicit at times about where the out-of-bounds death zone begins. Each world is laid out as a giant loop, and Bungie has said that each is larger than the entirety of Halo Reach, which was hard for me to wrap my head around because unlike that game, you're not battling inch for inch, tier by tier, even though the worlds are designed for guerrilla warfare. Instead, you're often skipping over the detail on your sparrow funneled into a handful of important areas over and over. Destiny's beta featured the entire Earth section more and less, so the idea of plunking down $60 at launch for that, four times over, was enough to make gamers anxious and put Bungie PR on the defensive. Here's another twist. 
Despite being larger and more open than any of the Halo games, all of that franchise's famous vehicular combat is nowhere to be found. There's no warthog dueling, no air shows, none of that. From time to time, the game will grant you an armed alien version of your Sparrow, but any speeder bike you mount is a fragile creature by design for a completely understandable reason. Players would wind up zipping through the entire game killing on their mounts, rather than on foot with the skills they've spent the entire game building. I do wish the game had some, like, racing mode, though. Dotting the landscape are little jobs that replace the conventional MMO fetch quest. Slay six enemies, collect ten of these artifacts, etc. Unlike the average fetch quest, these canned patrol missions are cut and dry affairs that don't build Destiny's lore. You're not helping moon farmers or Martian magicians, you're just scoring points with the game's various unseen factions. It's supposed to provide some structure to your roaming, but these are some of the most unexciting things you can do in the game. From time to time, a public event will emerge and you'll form ad hoc teams with first responders to complete goals. These are far less ambitious than the serendipitous multiplayer events Bungie originally sold them as, and I eventually found myself grinding them out just to fulfill bounties and get the rare drop. Story and side missions are the interchangeable meat of the campaign, but the former are punctuated with cinematics that push the game's razor-thin narrative forward. With little deviation, these outings involve battling to a checkpoint, releasing your ghost to prod an ancient, alien, or ancient alien computer terminal while you mollify waves of opponents before moving on to prod the next thing half a mile away. Boss encounters are sprinkled throughout these missions, but strikes are longer missions built around them, and the meat of a separate animal we'll get to later. When you need to cash in quests, buy items, or commit other forms of exclusive commerce, you'll wind up back at the tower and often. Between the lengthy and frequent transit times, and each world's tendency to tie all of its content to the same starting points, playing Destiny will test your patience quickly. Dungeon crawlers like Diablo or Torchlight solve this by randomizing the structure of their levels. Borderlands solves this with a tight narrative that pulls you through a string of large one-off levels with new quest hubs as you progress. Any standard MMO solves this by simply being expansive. Soon it becomes apparent that Destiny is a hollow pyramid of content. If we take the sheer size of the maps out of the equation, the campaign of Destiny feels like three Halo games worth of content holding up two Halo games worth of genuine mission content holding up a single Halo games worth of story. All the creative stuff ends up in the bottom, where the campaign lies, while the DLC has been more roof-raising endgame content that doesn't benefit new players. It's a minor miracle that the game's content doesn't implode. Now, this all sounds like bad news, and a lot of it is, but Destiny Campaign redeems itself in three big ways. Number one, bearing in mind that this is a scaled-up Halo game, Bungie added the obligatory RPG elements required to make this a title seaworthy for the long haul. Killing enemies and completing story quests will get you experience, but real advancement comes from completing bounties, which are essentially patrol missions handed down from the tower. Leveling up feels like real progression. By the time you finish the campaign, your character plays very differently than when you took your first steps on that dead Russian highway. It's simple, but works great. Number 2. Even the most tedious of Destiny's tasks is exciting with friends. I don't know why Bungie decided that 3 was the magic number for your standard fire team, but 4 player co-op has always seemed like mm, a little bit much in similar games. 3 feels pretty spot on here. You share the game's levels with a number of random players by default, although it's never a crowd, and this facilitates random hookups, but like any other MMO, your mileage will vary. The best option, obviously, is to recruit a pair of friends, or have a pair of friends recruit you in my case, and play with them as often as possible. Number 3, Dinklebot. The collective memory of last summer's Destiny beta wouldn't be complete without the endless wailing about your pal Dinklebot. Bungie hired talented actor Peter Dinklage to play your droning ghost companion, and guess what? They got what they paid for. This is fallen territory. We aren't safe here. I have to get you to the city. Mission accomplished. Despite the fact that his voiceover has been featured in Destiny content for an entire year prior, it wasn't until the beta that even the most high-minded of publications decided that his voice work was primed to doom the entire enterprise. Dinglebot isn't as charismatic as Halo's Cortana, but after several hours of Destiny's self-flagellating seriousness, 
Dinklebot's chirps become endearing. We love you, Dinklebot. That is, until you disappear entirely in the DLC. You really have to give props to Bungie for making Destiny such a beautiful and usable game. The graphics are incredible and the frame rate never hitches. The art direction and detail are amazing, but Bungie's reliance on hoity-toity pros like invoke the director instead of open the map screen seems a bit much. Sound design is generally never a highlight in a game unless it's done poorly, but here it's brilliant. The guns sound great and all, and that's expected, but it's the moments where standard foes are turned into memorable encounters that highlight their great work. <laughs> Marty O'Donnell's score is perfectly fine as action game music, but good luck remembering any of its themes or marches. The cursor-driven interface takes a little getting used to, but soon you'll be dismantling all those useless screen pickups like a champ. It's a little weird when the game's clean Euro-style interface clashes with its more medieval stylings, but uh, whatever. I'm far more irritated that its minimized interface doesn't deliver real-time updates on how far along you are when you're bounties, especially when it involves killing dozens or hundreds of enemies in specific ways. While Bungie deserves recognition for moving the console shooter as far forward as it did, Destiny feels like a game made in a vacuum. Many of this game's flaws feel like they've been addressed by other games over the years, games that Bungie didn't play or chose to ignore, which is sad either way. Destiny's greatest flaw, among its many errors, is its story. Now, to say that it's awful or shitty is misleading because that implies it made some attempt and failed. There's simply nothing here. By the time I'd finished the campaign and began to write this review, I realized I understood little to nothing about what had happened, or why I was introduced to each new world or villain when I did, or how I did, which is unbecoming of a Bungie game. The setup goes that on a trip to Mars we discover the Traveler, a giant gray space orb that's on the run from intergalactic darkness. The Traveler moves to Earth and humanity is able to colonize the solar system and live substantially longer and fuller lives. That is, until the intergalactic darkness catches up and starts ruining things. The game begins as you're resurrected by Dinklebot. Dinglebot and his fellow ghosts were built by the Traveler to search far and wide for new guardians to take up arms in a strange kind of mid-apocalyptic war to save humanity's last city. I say strange because it's hard to say what the darkness actually is. Each world hosts a different branch of the darkness, and it's implied that humanity's been fighting the darkness for hundreds of years now and losing terribly. But now there's a new the darkness, which serves as the leave antagonist of this game which is implied to be the mechanical Vex. But none of these races or covenants feel any more powerful than the other. In fact, in a throwaway comment, Dinklebot explains that the Cabal on Mars, who are obviously modeled off of Warhammer 40K's Terrans, have destroyed worlds for merely being in the way. But that menace never materializes, ever, for any of the races. Then again, I actually couldn't tell the Hive and the Fallen apart until I found them fighting each other on the battlefield. I thought that maybe, just maybe, these alien factions had some internal strife that would lead to some interesting and dynamic tension. Nope, they just look pretty similar. Aside from being slight, Destiny commits one of storytelling's worst crimes, telling and not showing. The Traveler is the most important character in the game, but we receive zero insight into its motives or feelings. Its liaison, the cleverly named Speaker, presents his client with cryptic non-statements. I could tell you of the great battle centuries ago. How the Traveler was crippled. I could tell you of the power of the darkness, its ancient enemy. The game's marketing is centered around the player becoming a legendary guardian that will help save humanity in its last city, but in my many, many trips to the tower, there was never any threat. Wherever this fight is happening, it's not happening anywhere near here. On the flip side, despite the hostility of the worlds you visit, there's no beachheads or guardian settlements to indicate progress despite how often you visit them or how many guardians you find coming through them at any moment. There are endless questions that Destiny raises and doesn't answer. 
Who are the XO or the Awoken, and where did they come from? Where did the factions come from? Who the hell is the robotic woman who stalks you with terrible dialogue? I don't even have time to explain why I don't have time to explain. What is the Black Garden? Do all the ghosts sound like Peter Dinklage? Dinklebot's load screen quips provide more narrative information than the cutscenes do, which kinda sucks if you play with friends because they're the best time to ignore the game. But there is hope! Destiny does offer some explanation, not much mind you, but you'll need to earn it in fragments called grimoire cards by completing various things in the world. With grimoire cards, Destiny delegates all of its universe building to a series of stoic prose on a separate website. Of course, the proper response to that is fuck that, but there came a point where I was so desperate for answers that I went to their stupid site and skimmed their stupid cards before realizing that I was complicit in their laziness. Holy shit this game sometimes. A lucky gamer received a copy of Destiny. They bought it, they got it as a gift, whatever. Despite the game's mandatory internet connection, they played the campaign solo, emerged from the Black Garden after some 15 to 20 hours, watched the final cutscene, then stowed the game disc in its case, and stopped playing forever. This is entirely possible. I mean, it could have happened to you. But it's also completely bizarre, because the campaign really only exists to filter players into the end game. At level 20, Destiny transforms into a new beast entirely, presenting you with the game's brightest brights and darkest darks, ready to dissolve hours, days, and weeks of the player's time with little effort. But if you don't have a dedicated group of friends to play with, consider yourself screwed at best. Thankfully, I had the aforementioned pair of Destiny Sherpas, or Derpas, to guide me through the endgame's Himalayas and min-max my climb, but let me assure you, I still had my fair share of the grind. In the end game, Destiny ditches the campaign's narrative, not that you'd notice, and all those custom-built story missions, something you probably will, to provide a whole new reason to continue the march to level 30 and beyond. You see, you've leveled up 19 times by gaining experience, but to go any further, you'll need to fill your four armor slots with new light-rated equipment. Your combined light ratings forms your light level, which combines with your original level to get your new level. It's strange, and I'm curious how Bungie will maintain these separate leveling schemes in future Destiny games. But wait! What are all these materials I've been gathering? And when I dismantle armor and weapons, what is this stuff that I keep getting? Why do I have four or five different currencies, and why are people so passionate about Bungie's endgame tweaks? Well, let me explain. If you've made it to level 20, your reasons for hitting level 30 plus are pretty big. You still love the combat, you've got those friends to play with you, you still crave that dopamine fix from loot drops, and you crave the exclusive raid content that only elite players can enjoy. But Bungie, like Blizzard, Nexon, Ansysoft, EA, or any other MMO maker, has to make a bet against the player's patience, and establish a balance between keeping the player interested and pushing back in such a way that keeps things interesting, but not too grindy, a fragile state that keeps the game going for as long as it possibly can. That new chest piece should be just out of reach, but not so far that you give up. Since there's not a lot of content in Destiny, Bungie had to be a bit more creative about how they slowed the player down. If you weren't confused to buy the armor thing a moment ago, then brace yourself, because this is definitely where Destiny gets complicated. It's this totem pole of complications that serves as the endgame's pleasure perpetuator, or misery engine. The first layer of complication is the RNG, or Random Number Generator. This is nothing new to gaming or even Destiny at this point. For 19 levels you've been picking up loot left and right, You've also been picking up engrams that provide an unnecessary level of loot extraction, but now you'll need the RNG and the new strike playlist to pick up your new light armor, because you can't receive it on experience or story missions alone. So if you refuse to leave fate exclusively to dice rolls, what's the alternative? Enter the next complication, those currencies. Eventually you'll get tired of playing through strike playlists over and over, especially when the same strikes happen consecutively and you realize that the game isn't actually generating enough rewarding drops. Not to fear, you actually have an opportunity to buy some of these outright. But don't get too excited yet. 
Glamour's been your primary currency since the very beginning, and you've probably got quite a bit of it lying around. It'd be far too easy to use that mattress full of Glimmer to buy everything outright, so Destiny devised a number of other currencies, all of which are capped to prevent hoarding for the same reason. Then there's the fact that some currencies are just harder to get than others, and you'll be required to mix up your routine to get them all. Next, vendors and factions. So you have these different currencies to avoid hoarding, but these tie nearly one-to-one -one with individual vendors as well. Not only will the vendors change their inventories on a regular basis, you'll actually need to gain rep with each faction to even access the really good stuff. Remember those bounties you were doing in the campaign to get wads of experience? Or all those multiplayer matches you hammered through to get those crucible marks? Well, those build your rep with said faction, so thankfully, you're not exclusively tied to strike playlists. Phew, right? But you know what? Bungie still isn't interested in dropping a whole bunch of armor on you. They want you to upgrade and stick to the pieces that you earn. This is why experience is still actually going to be a big deal in the end game. So don't think you can get away with not grinding away for that, but there's another big complication those materials. Four materials are based on all that dismantling you've been doing. Okay, so that means that upgrading is just a matter of getting a bunch of crappy loot you don't need. Got it? Nope! Each world has its own exclusive material too, leading to four more. When you need Spirit Bloom to fully upgrade your scout rifle and the RNG isn't being kind enough to hand you a fist of it, you'll need to hop around Venus in search of the glowing plants. If you need Spin Metal, be prepared to wander in circles around Earth doing the same thing, so on. This is sounding pretty great, right? So then as you ascend into Harder Strike playlist modes, you have two more Ascendant materials to upgrade your highest end armor. If you've purchased the Dark Below, you have two more Radiant materials to upgrade your raid armor. I imagine someone at Bungie was laughing maniacally when they suggested these things. Or maybe everyone was, because that's how ridiculous this is getting. Bungie is dictating not only how many spinning plates you need to juggle and what you need to play to satisfy their demands, but with another complication, they're dictating when you do it too. Yes, Destiny will now use time against you. Not only do you need to arrange weekly challenges and raids with friends, the latter becoming especially difficult as my derpas grew weary of them, but you run into other arbitrary factors. You can only gather 100 Vanguard marks a week. Exotic Vendor Zur is only available on weekends. To reach the top of Destiny's Pyramid, you need to either schedule appointments with the game in your calendar, or you need to, as I wound up doing, play for nights on end, accomplishing everything you can with the party you can assemble, then wait for quotas to reset. This brings us all back to our original complication, the one that powers and frames every other complication, the RNG, the cruel deity that all Destiny players pray to. There are few things more pernicious than spending the entirety of your modes of light to buy a legendary engram that gives you the chess piece you desperately need to level up, only it's for another class. Or for it to happen a second or third time in slightly different conditions with different equipment. Or maybe you want to hit level 32. Well, keep playing the Crota's End Raid over and over and over again, until the RNG grants you all that armor. Your reward for all those days and weeks of endgame dancing and grinding is the same armor as everyone else with the same rare weapons as everyone else. So here's the thing. You need those five committed friends to complete these, maybe a few less if you're high enough level, because unlike the strikes you've been grinding on for weeks, the raids don't feature any matchmaking to fill out your party. This works out because the raids aren't a matter of brute forcing your way through hordes of enemies, there's only six of you after all, but in solving puzzles. This is some Indiana Jones level trial and error here. When Bungie launched these raids, Vault of Glass after release and Crota's End with the Dark Below expansions, they didn't provide much instruction on how to dismantle them. So the earliest players worked together for hours to crack codes, figure out routines, and feel out flaws. By the time I got to Vault of Glass, my derpas preached raid maneuvers as if they were a science. That's not to say it was a breeze, because as a newcomer, you'll still need to learn the nuances, but before long it becomes routine, like everything else in Destiny, a tedious, grinding routine. But these raids are arbitrarily difficult in spots, and it's no wonder that players have spent so much energy finding flaws in their designs to make them more tolerable. It's also no wonder that Bungie bites back hard to plug these holes with similarly nonsensical fixes, 
like turning off or generating health or spawns. The reality is that this happens to every other major MMO, but where Destiny differs yet again is in the amount of content. With only so much real estate in the game, Bungie folds end-level events into kindergarten areas. As a low-level player, don't be surprised when you happen upon random camps of diabolically high-level enemies. Hey, this might even be a good opportunity to create a new character, but aside from different player talents, you don't get to experience a different story, or start from a different town. Even further, Bungie's got a track record of balancing guns in Halo, but not entire loot reward economies, and it shows. Every tweak they make upsets the beast that is the most hardcore of Destiny players, like ripping off and repositioning a band-aid on an open wound over and over and over again. So where do you draw the line when you review an open-ended game like Destiny? When do you stop and say, okay, I get the gist? Is it the fifth time you land on Earth? Is it 40 hours in? 50 hours in? The tenth time you do Nexus? For me, it came at level 29, when, for the first time, I didn't need to hide away in most of Crota's End, the game's ultimate event. That's when the future meant grinding out for and upgrading the pieces of armor that would bring me to level 32. But there were no new events, there was no incredible goal on the horizon, and no, as much as I wanted to invest days into maybe getting that exotic arc damage scout rifle, I wasn't about to hand any more of my life to the RNG. But when my friends came calling, well, it's probably time for more Destiny. And they'll find ways to survive. To summarize Destiny, a game with the grandest title in recent memory, is to judge two separate but enmeshed components, a campaign lacking in quality and an endgame lacking in quantity. Bungie should be lauded for stepping out of its comfort zone, but they didn't go far enough. The dynamism they talk about in their early Vidox never materialized in this game. By being so miserly in their attention to detail, Destiny winds up being overly designed, which in many, many ways makes the game feel so much smaller than its ambitions call for. Destiny never gives the player any breathing room to improvise. It never gives the player any sandbox to play around in. It's ironic that grinding away in the endgame gives you more agency to become legendary, than the expensive custom campaign they built to do just that. Despite years of coverage and my diligence for this review, I never once saw a comparison between Destiny and another game once set to steal my heart. Perhaps you've heard of it. Science fiction themed loot game, destined to be a multi-title franchise, based in the far future after one apocalyptic war and right before another apocalyptic war against a race of vicious robots, produced by a developer with a previously impeccable track record. If you said too human, well, good for you. Both games aim for the stars, and while too human burned up in the atmosphere, Destiny still struggles to hit low orbit. The reality is that Destiny will never be a great game. Its flaws are far too deep to repair, and another full game will be out before they can ever get close. Bungie claiming that the average player sinks three hours a day into their game is bittersweet, because it's in direct proportion to the amount of goodwill they're burning from their Halo days. Every player that drops out in this round isn't likely to come back for Destiny 2, 3, 4. If Bungie wants to avoid Two Humans' demise, a bigger carrot isn't going to cut it. They need to figure out how to handle all the rabbits. But this is a step in the right direction, even if it's a bit of a stumble. It's no surprise to me that this year's big addition to the Halo series will be an open world game, and I'm willing to bet good money that 343 Industries is taking notes from the Book of Destiny. 7 out of 10. Stay tuned for our next episode where I tackle something completely different, Square Enix's 2009 flagship role-playing game, Final Fantasy XIII. It may not be the first, but it is the nth review. I've been your host, Nick Pfeiffer. If you'd like to see more frequent episodes of the nth review, be sure to drop by my Patreon page. Be sure to watch my previous review, Forza Horizon 2. Oh, and hey, I'll see you next time. Guardian down.